Here's an idea. It's unethical to not develop artificial intelligence. Okay, forgive me my double negative for one second and just let me explain. Artificial intelligence, specifically robots which can learn, problem solve, and be creative, have been a signifier for futureness since about the mid 20th century. Sure, in the present we have Siri and Watson and Deep Blue and even the Kinect, all of which are built on artificial intelligence but lack a central feature of that shiny metal future from the movies. They are not embodied. They are stuck inside little boxes and left to interact with the world through their computerized voices and not, well, Bodies. Siri, tell me a joke. I can't. I always forget the punchline. Charming as they may be, these AI aren't much more than simple information valets, though that might soon change. If you've yet to have the pleasure, allow me to introduce you to Baxter. At $22,000 a pop, this robot, which has hands, eyes, is trainable, and comes pre-programmed with a certain amount of common sense, is cheaper than a year's worth of most repetitive Fordist human labor, and is smarter than his robo-factory ancestors. For some people, that is pretty threatening. And rightfully so. If you could have a staff of trainable, multitaskable Baxters, why would you hire people? People need managing and healthcare and birthday parties and casual Fridays on which to wear their Hawaiian shirts. And Baxter is not the only smarty pants robo bro out there. The Google self-driving car is just a predecessor to the Johnny Cab. Projo, the teaching robot, could become CGP Grey's digital Aristotle. Watson, yes, Watson from Jeopardy, is being rejiggered to work in diagnostic medicine. He could be the grandfather to Dr. Perceptron. There are even some very smart people developing a Perry Maestron for all of your legal bot needs. What I'm saying is that robots might someday replace us professionally. There's an idea. Now you probably think you know what I'm gonna say next. You think I'm gonna say all of these robots doing these jobs, that's bad. Putting all those people out of work, it's unethical. Except I'm not gonna say that. I'm actually gonna say that replacing human laborers with steely automatons is arguably one of the most ethical things you could do. Now, there's an easy line here saying that we would just make the robots do the jobs that human beings shouldn't be doing anyways. It's a well-traveled path, so we're not gonna go down it. Besides, we're not talking about artificial intelligence replacing just the dangerous and menial jobs, but also the complex, fast-paced, extremely precise, and knowledge-heavy jobs. That's a lot of jobs, and so that might cause a lot of problems. And the problems that come with large-scale social, economic, and corporate restructuring are many and varied, and some are real scary, but the more complex ethical discussion doesn't involve the relationship between humans and each other, or robots, but between humans and the future. Is it ethical? to stop improvement. Would it be ethical for us to stop making and deploying Baxters and Google cars and warehouse robots and streamline, simplify, cost reduce, and increase the reliability of any number of processes because people are currently doing them. Because up until this point, people is all we had. Philosopher Alain Badiou describes what he calls the ethic of truths. The most important thing is the event which seizes humanity and breaks it from the norm. That event and the way people are faithful to it can contribute to humanity's immortality as a group of beings which create and continue and there's a lot of hand waving when you talk about the future. Badiou writes that there is only one question in the ethic of truths. How will I, as someone, continue to exceed my being. How will I link the things I know in a consistent fashion via the effects of being seized by the unknown? Not following through, not continuing to make plastic pals that are fun to be with could be seen as a betrayal of that norm-breaking event. For instance, do we deny future generations the possibility of cheaper, better medical care from robot doctors because we want to maintain the no-robo status quo? I mean, the printing press threatened so much about the status quo, and we're all very glad we saw that through, aren't we? Not to mention the computer and the automobile, but hmm. Because human progress gave us medicine and the internet and cup holders, but it also gave us the atomic bomb. Furbies. Any ethics of progress has to account for the fact that on the horizon of that progress lays some terrible atrocity. It has to approach ideas of progress unobjectively. You can't stop progress isn't exactly the most comforting ethic, is it? Progress, as an ethic, can't unequivocally prioritize that progress before everything else. Happiness and physical safety are both pretty important, but an ethics of progress can help us organize what comes next in line. We have to accept the possibility of the bad stuff that comes packaged with progress and focus on what happens after the progress dust has settled. We have to keep going 
And why? Because of the greater, grander human experience we'd only be able to achieve with the help of our artificially intelligent robot friends. Arigato. What do you guys think? Is it unethical to stop the development of artificial intelligence? Let us know in the comments, and I for one welcome our new robot overlords. Subscribe. 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 I think the saddest music in the world is probably any song written by the Venga Boys. Let's see what you guys had to say about the source of emotion in music. CB George says that our emotional response to music might be a kind of chicken or the egg problem in that we are trained in some way watching movies and other visual media to associate certain kinds of sounds with certain images. And that it's kind of, he uses the word Pavlovian, which is great. Cisco QL asks, if sad music isn't sad, does that mean that a sad picture isn't sad? I think a lot of the same stuff applies, but a picture can be a lot more literal. It's not nearly as encoded as a piece of music. Um, but, you know, personal experience still plays a huge role in determining what your emotional reaction to an artwork or something is gonna be. Congratulations to Douchemaster, who managed to summarize the entire episode rather well in one comment. If you can find it, this conversation between Op D Day 2001 and symbioticism is really Really great. I suggest you try to get some get some control F happening. See if you can find it. Jesse Harris makes the astute point that the only piece of music which contains objective emotion is Yakety Sax, and I think I totally agree. Duke Keefty has a further correction on a previous correction, saying that MT Gox actually was Magic the Gathering and not Mining Team Gox, and that I I'm I don't know what to think anymore. O. Wolfgang makes a really interesting point about the enjoyment of non-mainstream music and music that doesn't contain standardized emotional content and wonders whether or not uh, when people enjoy that music, it's a kind of reaction or that they are uh, comforting themselves because they are responding to the mainstream, which I think is, is really interesting. It's really good. This week's episode was brought to you by the work of these diligent people, and the tweet of the week comes from O. Wolfgang Smith, who imagines the internet as one building, which it is.